Uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, and thank you so much. I can't tell you how much, Lynn, thank you, and for all of you, for the gift. It's not the gift. It's just the thought. That we, uh, we really appreciate that. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, the very beginning of the Gospel of John, <laughs> we all know the Nativity story. We all know the story about the birth of Jesus, the angel visitation, and Mary, and Elizabeth, and John the Baptist, and Joseph, and the shepherds, and the wise men. We all know all that. We grew up learning that as children. But how many of us understand what, what the intent is? Last night when we had service, we, we were talking about what does it mean is, you know, Patty was saying, I grew up in a household and in a church, and uh, it was a good household, and every Christmas they put the tree up, and they put the little manger set up, and we put the little train around, you know, like, you have to have the train around the manger. And, uh, and we knew about the baby Jesus, and we knew all that. But nobody, either they didn't tell me or I wasn't listening, which it could have been a little bit of both, but nobody bothered to say why it was so important. Why, why do we recognize this day? Now, we know if you go into the history of Christmas and the winter solstice, and we don't know when Jesus was born, and uh, the early church tried to take a pagan holiday and make it Christian and all that. But, you know, it, it really it's not about December 25th. It's not about trees and decorations. What, why do we celebrate? We ought to celebrate Christmas every day. Because that's when we mark the time when God entered in. He intervened. The eternal God, the transcendent God who is apart from everything, who created everything, that's the day that he chose to step into this creation that he made. And he didn't come here as some kind of superman or some kind of superhuman being. He came here as like that little baby in the back right there. I'm so glad you brought the baby here because that's just what Je Jesus, the creator of the universe, was like that at one time. Had to be changed, had to be fed, cried when he was hungry. Jesus. In John's gospel, John doesn't tell us the nativity story like Matthew does and like Luke does. And one of the reasons is by the time John wrote his gospel, the apostle John, it had been probably maybe 50 years or 60 years since the death of Christ. and The other Gospels had been written. The church had began to grow. The body of Christ began to grow through the preaching of the Gospel. And everybody had, you know, the, 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 the letters had been circulated. The Gospels, most of the uh, New Testament letters written by Paul and the other apostles had been circulated through the churches, and the church had be become like an institution in the early Roman Empire. And John, when he wrote his gospel, he is it's, it's way different than the other gospels. If you ever read the other gospels, you wonder, why is John so different? There's so many different stories. Because John didn't want to repeat the stuff that was in the other ones. He wanted to give a new insight. And John's purpose of writing his gospel was to convince the church that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Because by that time, certain false teachings and certain heresies were creeping into the church, creeping into the teachings of God's Word. And we have a lot of that today. That's never stopped. That, that continues to go on. Under the guise of, you know, Christianity or spirituality, people teach things about Jesus. They like to teach that Jesus was really just, just some man that, you know, got some spirit jumped on him somewhere in his life. or they, they try to make him to be anything but who he really is. And John wanted to write his gospel to convince the church to, that they would be anchored in the truth of God's word, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God in the flesh, God incarnate. Amen. That he entered into his creation. When he was formed in his mother's womb, he was completely God and completely man. Not half and half. But he was 100% God and 100% man. And in John's gospel, he begins like this. He says, in the beginning was the Word. Now, 
that word, word, okay, in the Greek is the word logos, L-O-G-O-S. And it was a word that the Greek philosophers would use to express the idea of the expression of God. You see, the ancient Greeks believed that there was a, a supreme being, but many of them believed that God could never exist in, in flesh. God could never exist in, in a tangible creation. So what they would teach, and the teaching, teachings of the Gnostics were, that there was a, a supreme being, a supreme God, uh, and he would speak the word, and he would create a lesser God, and that God would create a lesser God, and that God would create a lesser God, until they got to the point where they got to a God who was evil enough to be able to create everything in the universe. So they felt, and they believed, and they would equate the God of the Bible, Jehovah or Yahweh, to this lesser God. Because they never believed that spirit and flesh could be, could be one. So when John is speaking here, he's using words that philosophers would use. He would say, in the beginning was the word, the logos. And the logos was with God. And the word was God. And the philosophers of his day, the Greek philosophers, would probably nod their heads and say, yes, 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 yes. that's right. Okay. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made. That means this creation that we live in was created, it was spoken into existence by this word, yeah. by this logos. Some folks have challenged that. Over the years, over the last couple centuries, they've said, no, there's evolution and there's all this other stuff. Listen, I believe in a supernatural reality. There's some folks that deny any influence of the supernatural. Everything has to have a natural cause and effect. Cause and effect, cause and effect. So they, they look at creation and they say, well, this must have, there must have been some kind of scientific, uh, you know, some kind of a chemical reaction that caused this and caused that. He created all things. And any science that would say differently is what Paul calls science falsely so called. Okay, listen to what he says. All things in verse 3 were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Verse 4, in him was life. In him was life. The life that we experience is found in Christ. The reason why we're alive is because we have a living God. If you read about, and again, I've, I've done a little bit of reading about teachings on evolution and so forth. And, and they equate life to a series of, of chemical reactions. Now, we live, our bodies, you know, we depend upon chemical reactions. You know, things happen. We have all different kinds of enzymes and stuff in us that takes food and metabolizes it. And we have DNA and, and certain things, you know, molecular structures in our bodies that you know, reproduce, and, and that's, that was God's, God's intent. He created all that. But, you know, if I die, 10 seconds after I die, everything in my body is still going to be there, but I'm still going to be dead as a doornail. Life is more than just a chemical reaction. Life is something that comes from God. didn't happen by accident. It comes from a living, eternal being named God. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness doesn't understand it. So many folks, and as Patty has shared her testimony, without understanding God's word, without getting around people that understand God's word that might be able to teach, you'll believe anything. There's all, kinds of, there's all kinds of teachings, especially you get on the internet, you can find all kinds of teachings. <laughs> Crazy stuff. Amen. I got, I, I don't know if I should. The other day I came over to the church and there was, a, there was a, a white box in the mailbox. A white cardboard box. And I opened it up. And for some reason, it came from the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints. You ever hear them? You ever hear the name Warren Jeffs? 
he's the guy that had that place down in Texas and all the, all the kids and they would marry kids and for some reason they they gave they sent me these books full of all these claims that you know judgment is coming and and I don't know why they sent them to me. <laughs> I have no idea. Maybe they send them to like every church of God. I don't know. Maybe they just like figured they'd send them to churches. People believe anything. If you don't know the truth. God's word is truth. That's the light. The light shines in darkness. And you know what? My experience has been when I was living in darkness, I didn't want to see the light. Because when you get in light, and some of you all know, if you're getting old like me, the, the, the more light there is, the more you see the wrinkles. You try to keep the light down. In the... My wife told me today, she says, you forgot to shave today. I said, well, maybe I'm just growing a beard. I don't know, but all right. I didn't look close enough. All right. It says, the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. We don't understand. There was a man sent from God in verse 6 whose name was John. We talked about him last week. John the Baptist who was born of an old couple well past childbearing age. And the same came for a witness to bear witness of that light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lights every man that comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. It's natural for people to reject the light, because the light reveals our darkness. It casts our darkness out. The light reveals our sin, and nobody wants to be reminded that the stuff that we think is so important to us mostly is sin. We're doing a study in First John on Wednesday nights, and John wrote, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, because everything that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, sin makes us feel good. And when, when the light comes and shows us our sin, it causes us to want to reject the things that make us feel good in the flesh. So we reject it naturally. Listen to what... He says, verse 10, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. They nailed him to a cross. But as many as received him, I see, here's, here's the Christmas story. Here's why we celebrate the birth of Jesus. Here's why we celebrate, and why we ought to celebrate every day, when God became man, became incarnate, and entered into this creation. As many as received him, to them he gave power to become, what? The sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I can be a son of God. Some folks think that all, all people are sons of God. And I've said this a lot these last few days. People aren't sons of God if it's not for the love of Jesus Christ. If it's not for the blood of Jesus. If you have no faith in Christ, you're not a son of God. You might have been created in his image. You're part of his creation. And God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. But if you reject the gift of his son, you don't have the right to claim sonship. He says, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them which believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Have you been born again? Is the question. Jesus said, you must be born again. We have joy and sorrow in this life, but in the afterlife, it's going to be one or the other. You must be born again. And listen to what it says in verse 14. Here's the Christmas story. Don't miss it. And the word was made flesh. When the Greek philosophers would hear something like this, and those that, that would, that would uh, be a part of that, that, kind of, uh, that kind of philosophy, that kind of belief, when they would hear something about the God becoming flesh, they would say, oh, that can't happen. No, no, no. 
But I thank God that he sent an angel to a young virgin and said, that holy thing that is going to be formed in you it was a miraculous conception. We don't understand how it happened, but all we know is there was a baby formed in that mother's womb. And that baby was God. Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt, it means he tabernacled. He, made, he sent his tent up down here. It was temporary. You know this life here on this earth is temporary? The older I get, the more that is made a reality to me. I'm not going to be here forever. And neither are you. Unless Jesus comes back and has a rapture and raptures all up, we're all going to die someday. As I said before, that when I went through that thing with, when my dad passed away back in 1993, that was made so real to me that Christmas isn't about, you know, trees and presents and, and all that stuff. That's, that's all okay. That's good. Christmas is about when I die, I'm going to have a hope. I don't have to be afraid of dying. Death is a scary thing. And it's a sad thing when you lose a loved one. You don't see him anymore. It's a separation. But if that loved one knows Jesus Christ, you'll see him again. Listen, just reading a little bit more. I'm not going to keep you a whole lot longer because I know we want to get with family and it's Christmas. The word was made flesh and he dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John was one of the ones that when Jesus went to a place called the Mouth of Transfiguration. You can read about this in Matthew chapter 17. Right before his last trip to Jerusalem to be crucified, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his inner circle, up to the top of this mountain. And when they went up there, the light of God, the glory, the Shekinah glory fell upon him. And John was one of the ones that beheld Christ. He'd been walking with him for, for a number of, you know, two or three years at that time. And all of a sudden he saw him in glory. John says, we beheld his glory. I seen him in the glory of God. He says, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 15, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, this was he of whom I spake, he that comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Well, if you read the account, John was born six months before Jesus was. But John knew who Jesus was. He was the Word. This is speaking of John the Baptist now. Jesus was the Word who was with God and who was God. And of his fullness, he says in verse 16, have we all received in grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. I thank God that I don't have to depend on my adherence to any law to get me into heaven. I thank God I don't have to keep the Ten Commandments to get me into heaven. They've been written on my heart. The Holy Spirit dwells within me. They're a part of me, and I'm a part of them, because Christ is the law. He's not only the fulfillment, He is the law. He is the Ten Commandments. He is the other 300-some uh, commandments that were given in the Old Testament. The law that the Pharisees thought they could live according to, they tried hard. But Jesus said it would never be enough. A little bit more. Verse 18, No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Jesus was the only man who has ever been in the full presence of the Father. Because he was with him for all of eternity. Now there have been men who have seen what they call theophanies. God would appear in one form or another to certain people, individuals in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But to see God in, his, in the fullness of his glory, no man could stand. Okay, verse 19. And this is the record of John the Baptist. When the Jews sent priests and Levites, now just, now just get this picture. After 400 years of silence, from Malachi to John the Baptist, no visitation, no angel, no word from God, no prophecy. 
All of a sudden, there's this wild man out in the wilderness eating locusts and honey, dressed in a, a prophet's mantle, preaching. He didn't have 500 sermons. He preached one message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And he was baptizing people. And the people were flocking to him because they recognized that after 400 years, they're finally hearing from God again. He didn't have to put a sign on his chest that said, Prophet. He didn't have to get a website that said, Here, John the Baptist, the prophet. They knew he was a prophet because he was speaking God's word with authority. See, you don't have to advertise. If God's going to use you in the middle, you don't have to advertise yourself. You guys have heard me say that lots of times. Probably get sick and tired of hearing it, but it's the truth. You know, people want to put, they want to put their shingle out. Say, I'm a prophet, I'm an evangelist, I'm a blah, 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 blah. I'm whatever. If, if God has gifted you to be a prophet, man, ain't nobody going to have to question. You'll speak God's word, and that word will come with authority. When John the Baptist started out in the wilderness, he didn't come down to Jerusalem in the middle of town and start speaking. He was out in the wilderness, and he started preaching. They got wind of it, and people started flocking to him, crying out, broken, being baptized, being baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. When the Pharisees heard about it back in Jerusalem, the Pharisees were the ones that were supposed to be in charge. They were like the, you know, the tall hats and the, and the robes, right? When they heard what was going on, they said, we better check this guy out. He has not, we have not sanctioned him. We have not given him, he doesn't, he doesn't have our pass of approval here. So they sent folks out to check him out. And this is the record of verse 19, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed and declared, uh, denied not, but he confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you that prophet? Speaking to a reference, Moses talked about a prophet who would come. And he said, I'm not. Then they said unto him, who are you? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. What do you say of yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. Get ready because God is coming. Get ready because the kingdom of God is coming. Repent because the kingdom of God is near. That was his message. That was the only message that he had to bring. That was his job. And we know that after he got done doing his job, and after Jesus appeared on the scene, John said, I must decrease that he might increase. And you know what happened to John? He didn't retire to the Mediterranean Sea. He didn't go up to the Riviera to, you know, to a retirement home. He ended up in prison and ended up getting his head chopped off for righteousness sake. See, we think, you know, when we do God's work, well, God, you're going to give me a good retirement and, uh, you know, pad the old 401k and we'll just. <laughs> Listen to what he says. It says in verse uh, 20, 23, let's read it again. And we're, we're closing here. Verse, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as, the prophet, as said the prophet Isaiah. Verse 24. And they that which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him, and they said unto them, Why baptizest thou, if thou be not the Christ, nor Elijah, neither that prophet? You know, why are you doing what you're doing? And John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you, whom you know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes lash it, I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethbara beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. And the next day, see, John didn't know who Jesus was. He didn't know. He was waiting. He knew God told him that he would reveal to him who the Messiah would be. So the next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him, and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away what? The sin of the world. Not the sins, plural, but the sin of the world. Here he is. God has entered into creation. He's entered, he stepped into history. He stepped into time from eternity for the sole purpose of making me acceptable to the Father. That's the only reason he came. He didn't come here to make me rich. He didn't come here to make me famous. He didn't come here to you know, make, me, uh, you know, make my dreams come true. He came to make me acceptable in the eyes of the Father. Through faith in his blood. Thank you, 
There's been a whole lot of stuff tagged on Jesus that ain't true. There's been a whole lot of stuff dug up and... Just read a few more verses and we're gone. Verse 29. The next day John sees Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world... This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not. But when he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, John got a direct revelation from the Lord, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. John, God allowed John to see something nobody else saw. He saw the Spirit of God descending on Christ, and that was a, a key to John. That was a clue to him that here he was. Here's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And look at this in verse 35. Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And you think John would have said, Hey, wait a minute, Jesus. You taking my people? Later on, John says, My work's done. I've done what I was called to do. I've prepared the way. And lest anybody, and we're closing, lest anybody gets misunderstanding. Over in Matthew chapter 11, and you can read that when you get a chance. We're not going to turn there. Over in Matthew chapter 11, after John got thrown in prison, John the Baptist, the same John the Baptist that said right here, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. When he got thrown in prison, he must have got to thinking to himself, I wonder if maybe I missed it. I thought he was. I saw the, I saw the, I saw the Spirit descend on him. I, how sure it was him. He sent some of his disciples to see Jesus. And they went to Jesus and they asked, Are you really him? And Jesus said, You know what? He didn't, he didn't rebuke John. He just sent him, he said, go back and tell John what you see. The deaf are hearing, the dead are being raised, the blind see. Go back and tell John. And eventually John ended up losing his head for righteousness sake. See, sometimes we get to the point where we wonder, am I really hearing from you, God? Have you ever been there? Am I hearing from you? And did I miss you? I thought it was you. I thought I heard from the Lord. I want to tell you this morning, as we celebrate the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, you must be born again. And if you've been born again, and you've you put your faith in Jesus Christ, in the blood that he shed on Calvary, don't you let any devil or demon, or don't you let any person, or don't you let anybody try to convince you that it's not God. Because Jesus said right here, if you believe on me, you'll be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall not be ashamed. Did I really hear from you? Yeah, you did. Well, things ain't going the way I think they ought to go. That's all right. That's all right. I want to pray this morning. We're going to close in prayer. And as always, I just want to encourage you, if you need prayer for anything, we're going to close and dismiss. And You can go to your homes and your families. I hope and pray that we'll all have the ability to share our faith with somebody this, this Christmas. Let's look to the Lord. Father, we love you. Father, we thank you for the, your word, and we thank you for the gift. Father, we thank you that you stepped into time you sent your Son that whosoever should believe on him shall have everlasting life and never perish. I want to encourage you this morning, if you've never received Christ as your Savior, if you've never been born again, won't you please 
don't leave this church without coming and talking to me or one of the brothers, my wife, Brother Jairus, some of the other brothers, that we might pray with you. And you might say, what does it mean? What do I need to do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that he came to die for your sins. Believe that he is God in the flesh who came so that you might be accepted in the beloved, that God could accept you. Because that's what it's all about. In my sin, God could never accept me. In my sin, God would have to cast me out into the lake of fire. But covered with the blood of Jesus Christ, I'm made acceptable. Not because I've done anything good, but because of the blood of Jesus. I want to encourage you this morning. I'm going to ask you all to stand. Why don't you rise, please? We're going to dismiss this morning, but if you need to be born again, if you need the Lord Jesus as your Savior, please come up here when we're done. And, and please don't leave here without, without knowing Christ as your Savior. Your eternity depends upon it. It could be eternal joy in the presence of God or eternal sorrow in a lake of fire. That's what the Bible teaches. You might say, I don't believe in hell. Someday you will. That's what Jesus said. I'll go with his word. Father, we thank you for the gift of your son. Father, if there is one in here that has never asked you to be their savior, I pray, God, that you would even now draw them into your kingdom. Don't let one leave this place not knowing you. Father, I pray that everyone here will have an understanding of what salvation is all about. God, I pray, Father, that you would move in hearts this morning, that you would have anointed your word, Father, to touch somebody this morning in the name of Jesus. And that, Father, this Christmas might really indeed be the greatest Christmas we've ever had. We might not get a lot, but, Father, if one in here will call upon your name, but no greater gift could one receive and no greater gift could be given than the gift of salvation. Father, as we leave this place but not your presence, I pray for family members in here. There are family members we've been praying for for a long time. God, bring salvation to our families, to our households. Father, use us to be witnesses to who you are. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you and we'll give you glory. We ask these things. In Jesus' name. Oh, come.